America. We are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By honoring your sacred vocation of nursing, you impact your family, your friends, and your community. At Grand Canyon University, our online RN to BSN, MSN, or DNP degree programs allow you to balance online coursework with local in person clinical, practicum, or immersion hours. Find your purpose at GCU. Private, Christian, affordable. Visit gcu.edu. We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 148. I'm your host, Chris Webster, with my co-host, Paul Zimmerman. Today, we talk to Eric Olson about low-tech and low-cost solutions for archaeology. Let's get to it. Eric Olson is a professor of anthropology at Cuyahoga Community College in Cleveland, Ohio. He is the president-elect of the Ohio Archaeological Council, the president of Stewards of Historical Preservation, and has been teaching archaeology since 2018. His research focuses on lithics, digital archaeology, and finding cost-effective solutions to archaeological research. All right, everybody. Welcome to the show. Paul, how you doing? You know, I'm doing okay. Since we last recorded, we've had all sorts of snowstorms and uh, we've been digging out pretty much daily, which is nice. A little ironic that, you know, I think I've mentioned in the past how much of a skier I am and this year that I can't just, you know, go out and ski on a whim, but I have to plan it. Suddenly we have great snow after years of no <laughs> snow, but uh, you know, it's, it's nice to see everything looking wintry for a change in, in February. Uh, how are you doing, Chris? Where are you now? You're in Florida, right? Yeah, I'm in uh, Fort Myers Beach, Florida, and I actually had to come inside from working outside all morning at about one because it got too hot. The uh, 81 degree and slightly humid <laughs> temperatures, uh, I came inside to the air conditioning, so... <laughs> That's that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you didn't get as much snow, huh? Not nearly as much. No, no. In fact, uh, we've just seen reports of 16 foot, 300 pound, pound python found just near here. So uh, we're leaving Saturday. Not not because of that, but just coincidentally. So there you go. Uh, mm-hmm. South Florida is its own its own unique animal in the entire country. I don't think anything's like it. So yeah. Well, as I've heard before, archaeologists hate snakes. <laughs> yeah, exactly exactly yeah i think everybody hates 16 foot pythons but you know maybe not everybody so all right well we have a recurring guest he was on not too long ago we'll talk about that in a little bit here actually he was on uh, episode 136 paul wrote it down for me so on an episode on sustainable online archaeology which wasn't really that long ago in episode numbering land but we have as i mentioned in his bio eric olson from Cuyahoga Community College in Cleveland, Ohio. Eric, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. And uh, good job with the pronunciation. It's, it trips up everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I got to say, I want to plug this early. And you said you weren't trying to plug it, but I want to plug it. But in your uh, last email today, when we were talking about this recording, you mentioned you started a podcast since we spoke last. Let's Tell us all about it. Well, today was the first day I actually launched it on like multiple platforms. So you can hear it on Spotify. It's just called From the Archives by me, Eric Olson. And it nice. all started out of an idea I had in the spring of last year. I have all these books on my bookshelf and they are kind of obscure and rare books in some cases, like books that Mm -hmm. I acquired by inheritance from like other professors and, and through the grapevine. And I thought I would go through and talk about the books and why I think they're useful, why they're on my bookshelf, why I think you should try and get your hands on them if you can. And it was sort of a way to force me to look at my old books and my sort of library. And I have like 400 plus books for perspective. Nice. <laughs> so I have a lot of books. So I just did an episode today. I live stream every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on Twitch. So you're welcome to like ask questions okay. during recordings and tune in and whatnot. And I try to like get book reviews on them if I can. But like I said, sometimes they're pretty rare. So today's was actually <laughs> a review of Creekside, an archaeological novel by Kelly Carmine. Okay. Which uh, I actually ended up using two years ago in my historic archaeology class as sort of a creative way to incorporate different sort of learning styles. It's because it's historical fiction. Mm-hmm. So uh, mm-hmm. I uh, I 
reviewed it, talked about what the book was about, what my thoughts were on it. I don't want to spoil too much of it. I didn't speak super highly of it, but I hope she doesn't get too mad. I wasn't the only one who said that. My students hated it, but I mean, I don't think students are going to enjoy any book, to be honest. Yeah. You're going to yeah. make well, them not read? Not any book they're assigned. Oh, yeah. You want me to read? Yeah. But I mean, that's basically the podcast. You know, I, I do it once a week. It's like 25, 30 minutes. I talk about a different book. Sometimes they're really old books. Sometimes they're rare books, but they're always interesting. The first episode, I did Indian Mounds of the Middle Ohio Valley by Jerry McDonald and Susan Woodward. That was episode one. I, st- I just started this in January, so I've only been doing it for like mm-hmm. six weeks now. But yeah, I'm trying to pick books that seem to be focused on anthropology and archaeology, and we'll just see where it goes from there. Oddly enough, I'm doing dictionaries next week, but that's that's because it ties in <laughs> with the lesson I'm doing in class about dictionaries and how useful they can be. Is this a uh, a COVID project or is this something you've been, you know, mulling uh, and doing for a while? I think I'd been mulling it over like in the few months prior to the lockdown or not the lockdown, mm-hmm. but, you know, in March when everything started to shut down, yeah. I had been mulling it over back in like December of, I want to say 2018 and in, or not 2018, 2019. Gosh, <laughs> time's starting <laughs> to blur there, right? But yeah, like December, fall semester of 2019, I was like, oh, this would be a fun sort of way to get students to feel a little bit more personalized with me. But then also I realized there weren't really professors talking about the lineage of some of the, because I've met professors that have these just gargantuan libraries. And I'm just like, how do you acquire these things? And, you know, what are all these books about and why do you have them? And should you even have them at all? Like, did you, have you read them? I mean, I've, mm. I've talked to professors and they're like, oh, I have that book. I've never read it. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so it's yeah. also a case of yeah. like, I've never read some of the books on my bookshelf. So I'm actually forcing myself to read some of them now. And I'm actually really intrigued by like, clearly I picked them up at some point thinking they'd have some utility. And now I'm like, oh, yeah, this is really interesting stuff. Like I'm reading an ethnography from the 60s about Puerto Rico. And it's really interesting getting different sort of perspectives uh, in that regard. Yeah. Just imagine if we had an intelligent computer system, an AI, if you will, that had all the data from these books and papers and things in it, and we could query it with things we wanted to know. I mean, that's the dream, right? For all of us to just like, that's why we read books so we can have more in our heads to be able to do our jobs better and make better interpretations and, and think about things. There's just no good way to do that. We're getting close, I feel. You know, you can Google just about anything and see a whole bunch of perspectives, but that you get in trouble quickly with doing that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And I feel like, well, that's yeah. that's like will lead into something I want to talk about for uh, this week's topic. But yeah, I just feel like there's also something to be said. There's only so much you can do with like um, a search and an inquiry, like a, a keyword search. Mm-hmm. Sure. Like building context. I mean, this is this goes back into like linguistics and text mining, which is why I'm doing dictionaries in next week's episode and all the complicated ways you can do text mining. And it, it seems so simple when you're like, Oh, well, you know, just look for that one thing that you're looking for. And it's like, well, but what if they don't use the words that you're thinking of, or Mm -hmm. you really need to read the entire like chapter of a book to actually be able to walk away with any meaningful understanding of it. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. you can keyword search all day long for low level knowledge, but if you want critical thinking, there's, I don't think there's any way you can get around just having to sit down and read. Yeah, yeah indeed. I think so. All right. Well, speaking of this week's topic, let's get into it. We, we've interviewed you before, as we mentioned. We'll link to that in the show notes. And you came in and scheduled an interview. I encourage anyone who has something to talk about in technology and archaeology or just wants to, you know, uh, shoot the breeze on some stuff that they're doing uh, related to all this arcpodnet.com forward slash archaeotech. There's a schedule and interview link right on the side of the page there, and you'll see our interview schedule uh, and the times that we have for that. So feel free to go in and just schedule something. You don't even need to talk to us, to be honest. So I didn't. (laughs) The title, (laughs) exactly. It just popped up on my calendar. I was like, fantastic. (laughs) Effortless. (laughs) Uh, Oh, if it was all that easy. So... (laughs) I know, right? I know. So, Eric, you wanted to talk about essential low-tech equipment. So, where does this come from and why do you want to talk about it first off? So, it comes from necessity working at a community college. Uh, We don't have the luxurious budgets of other people, so I have to get creative with my solutions. But it's also a case of there's no reason to spend money on certain things that 
you could just as well get by like, you know, where you want to choose to invest your money, like cost savings, like you could invest in higher quality, more expensive equipment, but what's the trade off? Like you don't get to have better equipment in a lower level or a different, you know, the classic project managers triangle of, of what is it? Cost efficiency and quality or scope or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was also a case of, just me thinking about all the projects I've done in that cost savings regard. But also I think of it as essential technology and also essential like physical media, if that makes sense. So in my head, I started making a like Mm -hmm. uh, a list of top, like top low cost technology and then top low, I guess you could say computing power technology. Since this is a technology podcast, I figured it might make more sense to distinguish between like low tech, literally like you're putting pencil to paper versus like, this is low cost technology that you can easily incorporate that Mm. can enhance your, Mm. your sort of archaeology game. And, and to be clear, I'm not talking about like uh, field equipment, like essential personal items. Like, I mean, we could talk about those things. I certainly mold over like, well, we could talk about compasses probably for a whole hour, but I feel like, (laughs) I feel like that's not really where this could be going more like equipment that your crew needs or shares like not stuff that you Mm -hmm. should own and put in your backpack like if you can keep it on your person all the time then it's probably not the kind of tech that i was thinking of for this week's topic i hope that Uh, doesn't crush anyone's dreams no no that's true (laughs) (laughs) you're talking about this triangle the project manager saving time yeah yeah, saving time saving money or scope and that's very similar to uh, we discussed in the past uh, in fact we had episode 105 was uh, the triangle good fast or cheap pick two yep and it seems then that scope in what you're saying is project managers is basically the substitute for uh, for quality or good in in the one that i was discussing good fast cheap and i don't i'm asking this question because I think it might help guide where our questions go later uh, about what you mean by low tech. So how does scope differ from quality? And then what does that imply for the tools that you choose or or choose not to use? So I think, I guess maybe not scope, but it's probably more in a sense efficiency. Mm. To just give you a straight up example, we do not have a budget for a transit. Uh, We don't have a budget for for that. So we Mm. use an auto level. (laughs) Uh, we mm-hmm. we use a literal mm-hmm. dumpy level for yeah. all of our field work. So it slows us down. But I used to think like, oh, that's that's like a trade off. And I wish we really could buy a total station. But then I thought about it. And at least from an educator's perspective, I'm really grateful that we don't have a total station because I remember or really like a really nice Trimble. Like mm-hmm. when I say we don't have a budget, I'm saying like I asked for five grand like two years ago. And that was asking for the kitchen Mm. sink. (laughs) So we don't have a big budget. And I'm not trying to knock Tri-C, like Cuyahoga Community College Tri-C. I'm going to probably say Tri-C a lot just for reference there. (laughs) And it's not a knock against them. We're just not, I mean, community colleges just aren't geared for that kind of lab equipment. But really, I think of an auto level as sort of like an old school. When I learned how to do photography, I was forced to do it on film in black and white. Mm -hmm. And I had to go into the dark room. And I really mm-hmm. appreciated that, not because like I like uh, I'm a glutton for punishment, but because I don't think I would have appreciated or understood how photography works as a like concept in physics if I hadn't had to do that or actually had to realize the costs of the decisions that I'm making when I take the photo. And, you know, like there are costs in the dark room to overexposing or underexposing something and (laughs) when you would want to overexpose versus underexpose and all that sort of how light works and i think the same is true of an auto level or really even a plane table my top two things i put on the low low tech that's physical because i separate Mm -hmm. it from like low tech that's software uh, low cost software is an auto level and a slide rule or yeah that's right i said slide rule i didn't stutter or oh my goodness a french you know easel one <laughs> i do i actually have one sitting right here uh, here i'll give you some asmr i think here. there's an app for that you oh, can hear the slide oh, rule sliding oh, so beautiful <laughs> i have no idea how they work <laughs> uh it's it's bonkers simple how they work and i and i think I don't know. I'm just a big fan of the low tech in that regard because they're great teaching tools. I showed students how to use a slide rule in the last two field schools I've done. And they've walked away saying, I 
kind of like math now. Like this is really cool that you can literally just you could make a slide rule out of paper. And I think it's just a fun teaching aid that really gets people to start thinking outside the box, activates parts of their brain that they weren't necessarily thinking about before, can mm-hmm. make math fun, but also, you know, is a workaround too. We can't afford a total station. So we use a plane table sometimes in an auto level. So yeah, like the other thing on my list was uh, a French easel or a plane table. A French easel is essentially a plane mm-hmm. table, but for people who want to paint a canvas, mm-hmm. just don't put the canvas on. Yeah. So hold on a second here. First off, I searched for slide rule on the Apple App Store, and there are many apps for slide rule. So I'm just going to say that. <laughs> Take that for what you will. <laughs> so there is an app for the slide rule, which is phenomenal. Also, honestly, I feel like you know, it I, I the have to, yeah. <laughs> It defeats the purpose because the whole beauty of the slide rule is it's not it's it's mechanical. Like literally, I tell students, I keep this on me in the field because it doesn't need batteries and I can drop this in a creek. I can drop this. I can have it be run over because it's solid steel. Mm -hmm. This thing is built tough. And so I can always do math no matter what. It can do trigonometry even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And. Yeah, the other thing, responding to what you said about the total station. So I, I totally understand what you're getting at with the fundamentals. I took black and white photography in college as well, and I didn't really know anything about photography. I was just kind of in a, let's call it an in-between period between aviation and anthropology, where I took a whole bunch of math classes and photography because <laughs> I wanted to take fun stuff while I was figuring out what I was doing with my life. So I totally understand that. And also... Like even in my book, I have a whole chapter about, you know, mapping by hand, basically uh, compass and pace mapping. And because there's a lot of people that use a Trimble, for example, to do uh, you, you ask them to create a map of the site and all they'll put on there is the artifacts, the datum and a site boundary and the features. They don't include any of the geographic features. They don't include the drainages. They don't include the any. They might include a road, but they might not. They don't include any of the stuff that helps you really set the site in space on a sketch map. But if you have them draw it, they do, right? Like mm-hmm. drawing yep. just kind of lends yourself to thinking that way. Mm-hmm. And if you le- if you started doing site sketch mapping by drawing, like I did and like, like a lot of us did, then you just kind of translate that stuff and you think about it when you do a Trimble map. But if you start on a Trimble map or some kind of digital map, for some reason, it just doesn't seem to translate because it doesn't lend itself well to drawing first off, but you can still get those things on there. But along this sort of another line though, I understand, you know, I'm trying to figure out like where colleges decide to spend their money because I have been on so many projects where a total station was in need and even on site. In fact, the first project I, I was on was an excavation that had a total station. They basically said, does anyone know how to use this? Because literally nobody right. did from the techs all the way up to project managers. And I ended up taking it home for a weekend living on YouTube and I learned how to use it. And for the rest of the time I was on the project, I was the total station guy. And it's a real problem when people get into this field because the the companies don't have time to teach them either. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And yep. And they may rent one for a project on a one-off and no one knows how to use it. <laughs> yep. So I don't know. I don't know. Hey, let's let's take a quick break and I'll get your response to that on the other side of the break. I just realized we're up on time. So let's do that so we have a proper time to talk about this on the other side. Back in a second. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months or go to zencastr.com and use the code archaeotech that's a-r-c-h-a-e-o-t-e-c-h looking to expand your knowledge of x-rays and imaging in the archaeology field then check out an introduction to paleo radiography a short online course offering professional training for archaeologists and affiliated disciplines created by archaeologist radiographer and lecturer james elliott the content of this course is based upon his research and teaching experience in higher education It is approved by the chartered institute for archaeologists as four hours of training that's in the uk for those of you that don't know so don't miss out on this exciting opportunity for professional and personal development for more information on pricing 
imaging and core structure, visit paleoimaging.com. That's P-A-L-E-O imaging.com. And look for the link in the show notes to this episode. America, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By honoring your sacred vocation of business, you impact your family, your friends, and your community. At Grand Canyon University, our MBA degree program is 100% online, with emphases in business analytics and finance to help you reach your goals. Find your purpose at GCU. Private. Christian. Affordable. Visit gcu.edu. Welcome back to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 148, and we're talking with Eric Olson about low-tech essentials. And, you know, Eric, at the end of the last segment, I was talking about total stations and how people don't know how to use them. And I really think they should be taught in school because you have the biggest opportunity to touch the most people before they get out into the world. What do you got to say about that? <laughs> yeah, so I feel like I was put on blast first off, but that's OK, because we don't have a total station. But I feel like a total station is important to understand, but I feel like that's important from a software, like learning how to use the computer standpoint, that's independent yeah. of understanding the fundamentals. So if you understand an auto level, a total station, like the moment you get to one, you're like, wait, it does the calculations for me. I don't need a slide rule. I don't need a calculator. I don't <laughs> like I, I, literally the students. I, yeah. I remember in the 2019 field school, because we didn't do a field school in 2020, when we did that that field school with an auto level, I had students clamoring to do the auto level because it, it required someone to just hold the the rod and then it required mm-hmm. someone to cite the coordinates. And, you know, the students loved like qu- quizzing each other for some reason on the math and testing each other like, hey, did you actually do the trig right? Because I wanted them to try it out. And I thought it was a good learning tool. And from personal experience, I was taught how to map things with a trimble and I had to teach myself and end up learning via a land surveyor how to use an auto level. And then I, I also ended up buying several old books on surveying, like survey books, like survey textbooks from like the 19 teens and using those. I ended up using them in my historic archaeology class even. So my trimble education I just knew you enter in a dot on the map and it never gave me any sort of spatial awareness. It was just like, okay, you stand in this spot and wait for the satellites to accumulate and then you press map and then you move on Mm -hmm. to the next one. I had no formal understanding of how a GPS worked when I was handed a trimble in the field. And I feel like that sort of hampered my ability to do quality survey work because it didn't force me to think spatially. It didn't force me to critically evaluate things, didn't force me to think outside the box and think creatively. And I think having something like an auto level or a plane table allows you to realize, hey, I may not have a total station on hand, but I can get really precise measurements without one and I don't need one. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the benefit of something like an auto level is it makes you appreciate something like a total station once you do get to one and you don't have, and it's literally just a matter of, okay, what are like the, the specific buttons of the remote control kind of thing? Like, how do I turn it on? How do I turn it off? How do I reset it? You know, how do I uplink it to my computer? So then it transfers all the files. Honestly, Mm -hmm. in this day and age, that's pretty like not, as hard to teach stuff because we're all so used to having to know that basic technology of upload, download, you know, basic computer technology. Right. Right, But to understand and appreciate like, uh, you know, the math behind it, the angles behind it, knowing elevation and how important it is where you place your tripod is going to affect, you know, your elevation measurements and how difficult it's going to be to see long distances and whatnot. I think that's, that's the benefit of something like a plane table or, a, um, an auto level plus a uh, plane table is like a mobile desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're fun. I, I, I had a project manager that uh, came out and used one on a site. He basically had it on like a, a monopod thing. He would stand in the middle of the site and make the most amazing site sketches I've ever seen in my entire life. So yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of cool. But do you think there will ever be a time when, or, or should there ever be a time when something like understanding the fundamentals behind a total station or a GPS or something like that is even important anymore? And my one, my, a good example of that is how many people under the age of 25 do you think understand how an internal combustion engine is? Or how do many people under 50 understand how their electric hybrid car even works? You know what I mean? Yeah, but does it but, matter? 
it does matter because we are partially land surveyors. That's, I mean, you yeah. don't need to be an auto mechanic to drive a car, sure, but if it breaks down, you sure need to know how to fix it or know someone who does. And I think for archaeologists, I don't think there will ever come, ever come a time where, say, a total station or a GPS, we don't need to understand it. And I know my students right now, even if they don't go on to archaeology, the knowledge that they gain out of learning how to use a compass and uh, like in my intro to archaeology class, I make them do a compass mapping exercise. That's what they're doing this week. And next mm-hmm. week they have yeah. to do maps and map reading a- and, or learning that their cell phone doesn't actually usually link up with the satellite. It's pinging off of cell towers, but it's the same principle as, as a GPS triangulation. It's just not using satellites to triangulate. Students mm-hmm. are just baffled by how that works. And it totally changes not just their perception of space, but also how they use that technology and interact with it. I've had students say, I did not realize that my phone is constantly tracking me. And I was like, yeah, like people can figure out and and market their advertising to you just based on your mobility. Like they don't need to mm-hmm. know, like they don't need to listen in. They can learn just as much about, you know, your behaviors based on where you're going and how long you're spending there because your cell phone is literally triangulating your position with cell towers uh, than any sort of conversation that they would record. And so I had students that they've never thought about that until like we started talking about how GPS works and how cell phone GPS works. That's great. I do like your... um... And actually, I'm a little surprised to hear you, Chris, uh, talking about the photography with uh, with film and black and white. And that in the past, <laughs> you've often expressed how much you would love to have, you know, some tricorder that could scan everything and just tell you what it was. Uh, and I've always been more of the type that that says, oh, I like photography and I love photography, as uh, as I know we've discussed. But I also like drawing. And I think that the two complement each other, right? You know, so the drawing. Yeah. For example, a, a profile you're 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 interpreting what you're seeing, and then you take the photograph to take a more quote unquote objective view of that. So I like what you're saying, Eric. Uh, you know, going to the more low tech means to understand why and how, and understand the human component of understanding what we're looking at, uh, rather than just pressing a button and having some data. Right, and that actually jibes really well with when we used to write our own. Uh, surveying software, we train people to use it. Uh, we tell them to pretend that the uh, that the prism pole was a very large pencil, and we'd show them how if they were doing architecture, because mostly we're dealing with people who are working in the Mediterranean with uh, stone architecture. It's like you can trace the outlines of the wall, and depending how you do it, you can show going dot to dot that these two walls either one abuts the other or they interdigitate. They are they're bonded together. Right, and that tells you something about mm-hmm. how the, the the building was constructed. But if you're just taking points without thinking through it, you don't get that kind of data. You don't get that kind of detail. You don't get that understanding of what you're doing and necessarily why you're doing it. So you lose information. So I do kind of I I, I got to say, Eric, I, I like your approach. Uh, the only other thing <laughs> I would add, because I think we should probably move on to a few of the other things on my list of low tech that I have. Oh, yes. <laughs> the only thing I would add is also I feel like there's a difference in spatial reasoning, like spatial, like spatial awareness, I should say, with uh, GPS plotting versus like anything like a total station and an yes. auto level or plane table, because you just don't think about things the same way, in my opinion, when you're just putting dots on a map. And mm-hmm. what's more is when you go to upload it and you're just looking at a bunch of dots after the fact, you're like, what the heck am I looking at? Like, I have to reconnect these. And sometimes your notes, if you're not good with your notes, and I've had this mm-hmm. happen with some students, they're just like, oh, uh, this, they just like abbreviate something. And I have no idea what this, what this <laughs> GPS coordinate is connected to. It's like, is this like a dip in elevation? Is this like a, a pool of like water in the, in the middle of a field? Like, what's going on in this, this little pinpoint? Mm-hmm. You're like, I don't know. And then you just, it's a waste of, of, of everyone's time. Whereas I feel like if you have to do it with these other methods, because they are more time consuming in that regard, even if it's only like a little bit more time consuming or the fact that you need a second person uh, mm-hmm. in the case of someone who in the prism really forces you to be like, do I need to capture this or do I not? Do yeah. I need to make someone stand there? And if you have to ask yourself that question and you don't know, then I think that's a great way of evaluating what's worth mapping and what's not. And that's all I've got to say about total stations. 
<laughs> that actually is a decent segue, something you just said, but I, I would like to come in briefly. While I do want a tricorder because I'm obsessed with efficiency <laughs> and the quicker I can get something done, the quicker I can move on to the next thing and the more I can do, I still want to kind of know how it works. You know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. no, of course, uh, um, of course. I know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Eric, what tech do you feel has saved you time, money, or scope? You mentioned the project manager triangle earlier mm-hmm. at the expense of one of them that you just can't live without. Well, I made a list of five or six things here. We've already talked about, I mean, I guess it doesn't actually save me time, but I put the auto level on there. Um, it <laughs> certainly is faster than tape. <laughs> sure, sure. But I put on there a good camera. It could be a DS, I mean, DSLR, obviously, digital. And then mm-hmm. the last two I want to really emphasize are a metal detector and a bucket auger. I think those mm-hmm. two are, you know, especially in the Midwest where we don't have nice desert conditions like you do out West and you can do surface survey mm-hmm. all the time. I really think a bucket auger and a metal detector when paired together can really enhance efficiency in ways that traditional shovel testing, which I mean, shoot, I could I could talk to your ears off about why shovel testing is a waste of everyone's time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I hear you. But but to keep it short, I mean, I wrote a, a, an article in the Pennsylvania Archaeologist where I did a comparison over time between surface survey of a plowed field and shovel testing following Pennsylvania SHPO guidelines. And I demonstrated that, like, statistically, you're missing like 99.9% of smaller sites. Like, if you're looking for Teotihuacan, mm-hmm. yeah, shovel testing's fine. But <laughs> if you can't find Teotihuacan without shovel testing, I think you've got larger issues. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I started using the bucket auger and a metal detector to sort of complement each other. You can quickly test a metal detector hit with a bucket auger. And mm-hmm. if it's larger than the size of your bore of your bucket auger, then obviously, you know, you need to make a larger test unit. But a lot of times things that are, are metal detector hits in the Midwest tend to be small items like coins, belt buckles, uh, spoons, things that if you have an eight or 10 centimeter diameter Uh, bucket auger, you're going to be able to hit it and pick it out. And what's also nice about a bucket auger is it's consistent in size and volume Mm -hmm. so that a shovel test, I mean, you guys have seen bad shovel tests from students. The walls start coming in. They're not consistent. And even professionals, you know, because they're in a hurry, because, you know, time is money when you're on on the, the clock, you know, sometimes these shovel tests don't look as nice as they could be. And it's not consistent in volume. Whereas a bucket auger, it's always going to be the same amount, no matter what. And they're usually much easier on your back and knees. So I've had older students that work in, in the field with me, and they can just fly through a bucket auger. You know, a shovel test yeah. would take them, you know, a, a new student. I've seen them take anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes, which I know is unacceptable, but they're learning. So they've <laughs> never done it. But I give them a bucket auger and, and having not done neither or either case, I should say. They can do the bucket auger in like 15 minutes. Easy. Yeah. And so it's it's just leaps and bounds better. So we can we can crank out bucket augers so much faster. Plus, it's a soil core sample. You know, it's less invasive than doing a 50 by 50 centimeter shovel test, which is what we do in Ohio. So sorry, I, I'll get off my soapbox about the bucket auger. Huh. No, don't. <laughs> I, in, in case any of your students are listening, I will tell them, tell them I did a shovel test in the worst environment of my entire life in Vermont in what they called Virgin's Clay off of Lake, oh. what was that big lake up there uh, with, lake with Burlington? Sea Monster Champlain. in it? Yeah, Lake Champlain. Yeah, Champlain. With, with Champ. Yeah, yeah, with Champ. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But no, we did a shovel test on the end and, and we were doing these square 50 by 50 shovel tests. And so you, you tend to get better walls because they're like mini excavation units. But my partner and I were told to go as far down as we possibly could to get a stratigraphy regardless of artifacts. And it took us two days in the rain and mixed snow in this clay to do that shovel test. <laughs> two days. It's the longest shovel test I've ever done. <laughs> uh, and if you're but just I'm, looking for a soil profile, yeah. just get just get an auger. Oh, right. That's all we could have done. I mean, that's all we should have done. You're totally right. And I've, I've done a lot of auger stuff too, down in like South Carolina, North Carolina, Vermont. Uh, and it's just, it's invaluable to get even way deeper. Like when you're trying to get some of the really early paleo stuff uh, in certain circumstances, you can kind of start getting a sense of what's down there, which is an auger versus, you know, full scale excavation. So there's lots of good, we've, we've augered down three, four meters before with just a bucket auger, like a 10 inch bucket auger. So 
gets a little hard to pull up when it gets down that deep, but either way. What's nice about a bucket auger is also just the sheer number of things that we're able to do that I don't think people were really thinking about like, you know, 10, 20, you know, 30 years ago, like the amount of tests we can run on the soil. I think there's more people starting to realize like we can do reconnaissance surveys with bucket augers and get a lot of data just from the soil. Like just because Mm -hmm. I didn't find a whole lot of artifacts, like a low density scatter, you know, you might not have found that even with the surface survey. But if you look for things like phosphorus content or you look at, you know, you do paleo botanical analysis or sediment, other types of sediment analysis, flotation, you know, all of these different things you can incorporate. Sure, they're going to be a little bit time consuming after the fact. But I mean, at least in, from my experience, I think the biggest time sink is the time you have to spend in the field uh, as opposed to lab work, at least from what we've done here in Ohio. I, you can speak differently, but, you know, you can grab soil and sit on it for as long as you you have the time for. Or if you're just doing a salvage excavation, like as a small community college, you just get a bunch of soil samples and, you know, run them through some simple soils analysis. And mm-hmm. you've got a lot of useful data that didn't require students to spend all day digging, you know, 50 by 50 centimeter squares. Yeah. Agreed. And, you know, maybe we'll just make a, a final word on shovel testing here before we move on. I mean, like you mentioned metal detector, but I think CRM in particular, and probably most things don't utilize non-destructive subsurface testing methods enough. And then that, that minute, like, hit testing, you know what I mean? Like with the metal detector, mm-hmm. you're testing the hits of the bucket otter with, with, uh, you know, GPR and, you know, resistivity and all the other things that you can do to do subsurface testing. I don't think they just put a high enough value on what that can actually tell you about the subsurface environment. Because like you said, like the Pennsylvania SHPO requirements in every state's SHPO requirements, they have to have some kind of guideline, right? But too many people use that as the rule and not the guideline. And you got to look at site densities in that area. What are the most common things, you know, found? Mm-hmm. If if all you ever find is three flake lithic scatters, you're not going to find them on a 30 meter interval shovel test. You know, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so if that's what you're trying to find, you're not doing a very good job. So let's take yeah. our final break and come back on the other side and uh, keep talking low tech with Eric Olson. Back in a second. America, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By honoring your sacred vocation of education, you impact your family, your friends, and your community. At Grand Canyon University, our online bachelor's, master's, and doctoral education degree programs allow you to balance online coursework with observational and hands-on experience in the field. Find your purpose at GCU. Private, Christian, affordable. Visit gcu.edu. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. You need parts? O'Reilly Auto Parts has parts. Need them fast? We've got fast. No matter what you need, we have thousands of professional parts people doing their part to make sure you have it. Product availability. Just one part that makes O'Reilly stand apart. The professional parts people. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Auto Parts. Hi, welcome back to the Architect Podcast, episode number 148, the third segment here. We're talking low tech with Eric Olson. And Eric, you'd mentioned this kind of in passing a couple of times in our discussion so far, where you're talking about low tech, but you don't just mean low tech as in simple equipment like the uh, bucket auger that you're just describing, but also in some cases inexpensive, but still computerized. So low barrier to entry. Do you you want to expand for us what you mean by that and give us some examples of low barrier to entry, inexpensive computer technologies? Yeah, sure. So when I was thinking about this topic of low tech, I thought low tech, low cost, low barrier to entry Uh, Because you can still have a lot of power in something that is accessible to everyone. And by that regards, I would consider that low tech, because if anyone can download it and use it, then in my mind, it should be ubiquitous low tech. And by that, I mean, mostly software. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about hardware. Like we could talk about Raspberry Pi. Sure. I'm um, getting one in the next month or so. Um, I'm waiting because it's back ordered, but that's a whole different can of worms. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and getting getting into Linux and all that stuff. But uh, these I, I made a list of four 
I guess you could call it software or things, components, whatever you want to call them, that came to mind for me that I think everyone should have some familiarity with or should at least dabble in and experiment with. And Chris is not going to like my number one on the list. It's QGIS. <laughs> Oh no! He oh, hates I love QGIS. QGIS. Uh, <laughs> Come on! I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think in this day and age, for I mean, maybe not for you guys because you're you know well established in the field, but I think anyone who's getting into archaeology now and hasn't at least dabbled or played around with with uh, QGIS in particular, but just free GIS software and has a basic understanding of how it works. Um, Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, not understanding how to use a camera, you know, seems sort of um, absurd, I guess, in this in this day and age. But Mm -hmm. uh, QGIS is it's free. It's constantly being updated and uploading new versions of it. Um, I was just using it today while I was live streaming. I was making a couple maps, like even if you're just making maps like that's still benefiting you or the interpolation function in a lot of GIS Mm -hmm. software is, I think, the real heavy lifter because it's a it's a great way to do spatial statistics Mm -hmm. and you don't have to learn all the different ins and outs and bells and whistles of what you can do like you want to do least cost paths great i think you should explore that but maybe you know start with something small like or not small but interpolation because not only will it help you understand better how like elevation maps work and how those are made but it also Mm -hmm. give you a better understanding of what kinds of data can i start sampling that can then be interpolated like, hmm, the frequency and density of lithic scatters or firecracked rock or, say, the phosphate levels of these soil samples I got with my bucket auger or the locations hey. of metal detector hits or something that I actually ended up doing and it's in press right now with open archaeology and using a metal detector to sort of be a poor man's gradiometer using interpolation and the ground balance function on a metal detector. Um, I could get into Hmm. all the finer details of that, but I can just share it with you guys and you can mention it in the show notes of some future episode when it's finally released. (laughs) 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 But, but that's only possible because of interpolation functions in GIS. So, Mm -hmm. I, GIS is my number one in terms of low barrier to entry. Sure, you have to learn stuff, but it's free and accessible. And all you have to do is be willing to play around with it and make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Well, I like that you're leading out with that because GIS is often considered one of the more complex domains for archaeological computers. <laughs> and uh, that you're saying, hey, just jump in with it, play with it. You're not going to hurt anybody. <laughs> is is uh, That's a fun way to, to, to go about learning how to how to use any kind of software. Yeah. I mean, what's the harm in, in playing around with it? Um, I, I wouldn't recommend trying to learn it if you have to for like a job or a project. So try and learn it in a risk-free environment where if you mess up on the map or you make mistakes, it's no you know no harm, no foul because you're doing it for fun to learn. Mm-hmm. And if you think GIS is a hard barrier to entry, buckle up for my second one on the list here. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are really going to hate this. R. I think people should dabble in R. Um, <laughs> if you're not familiar with R, it is a specific, I guess you could say like programming language, but also like software that's a statist- statistics package. Yeah. It's, I mean, if there are some statistical analyses that can really only be done in R unless you own some alternative like SPSS. Although I guess you could get away with like PSPP or Jasper. I'm throwing out a lot of names and acronyms here and I recommend anyone who's lost, just Google these or look them up um, just to see, because a lot of these are free and you can, once again, just play around with them, get familiar with them. You know, R intimidated me two or three years ago, but I think if you are, you know, humble about it and willing to make mistakes, then I think there is an opportunity to do some really strong analysis in R. But yeah. tell just tell Google people, Eric, what R. they can... <laughs> Yeah. Tell people what they can actually get out of this, though, because I think a problem with some of these technologies, especially some of the programming stuff, like people generally know what they can get out of a GIS, although most people are just scratching the surface. But something like R and some of these other programming technologies, what kinds of stuff are you finding useful out of that in your own use cases? So maybe people can say, well, I've got the same use case. Let me go look this up. 
So I would say for certain forms of qualitative statistical analysis, non-parametric, I should say specifically, not to use high statistical terminology, but things like a chi-squared test, people probably know that one. And it's, I mean, it's mm-hmm. old hat. Like everyone knows how to do a chi-squared once, like once they learn chi-squared, they're like, oh, I'm going to do a chi-squared on this and I'm going to do a T-test on this. And it's like, well, there are more tests <laughs> that you can do with uh, non-parametric data or just basic frequency and count data. And these are things like multiple correspondence analysis or correspondence analysis, which is really exploratory. And most, I've only ever seen it once. And I think it was on one edition of SPSS. And then they ended up getting rid of it for the next iteration of it. It was like SPSS 20 or something like that. And then the next release, Mm -hmm. they got rid of it. Yeah. Multiple correspondence analysis, which my, my whole master's thesis was actually about using that specific statistical method to test these sort of abstract models for functionality. So like how do you quantify or I guess quantify or quali- qualify like comparing say feasting behavior versus mortuary behavior? Can you do that with specific key indicator artifacts or distributions of them and have a means of testing which one better or best fits the data? Now that again yeah. I could share my thesis in the show notes too if people really wanted to uh, to get into that. But also sure. things like geometric morphometrics. So shape analysis. I think a lot of people, mm-hmm. particularly with stone tools, think of things like, oh, maximum length, maximum width. Maybe they're looking at tip angle if they're really getting into the weeds. But there's so many measurements that we think of with, I think, stone tools, obviously, because I'm a lithicist. But if you can do landmark analysis, just outline the entire thing with key landmarks, anatomical landmarks, like the shoulder, the tip, the base points, the Mm -hmm. maximum indent of the the notch, the narrowest part of the neck. You can actually do some crazy intense geometric morphometric analysis, like statistical analyses that they've been doing in paleontology and in biology for like 20 to 30 years now. And in fact, Dr. Michael Schott at the University of Akron, who's now retired, he's been doing this kind of stuff for like 10 years. Surprise, surprise. I I work closely with Dr. Schott. <laughs> no, no surprise, I guess. But all the sorts of analyses that he is doing right now are really something that you could do very easily in R. And the alternatives just aren't hmm. really there right now. So, and, I, and these are like really incredible kinds of groundbreaking analyses of like understanding what what changes between, say, you know, late woodland spear use versus, say, bow and arrow use? We can look at the trajectory changes and shape to understand something about function and form and uh, maybe the physics behind it that you otherwise wouldn't get. Or looking at relatedness by shape. Like, how does the projectile point style of, say, the early woodland morph into the projectile point styles of the middle woodland, morph into the late woodland, into the late prehistoric? And I know I'm using terms that are Midwest specific, but you get my idea of, you know, right. people don't really right. don't really look at these typologies and say, are these valid? And geometric hmm. morphometrics is a statistical analysis that you can actually start to say, these Morphometric types like uh, Jack's Reef Corner Notched, or I don't know, name a name a point type out where you're at, and for you guys, just for reference, Elko Corner Notch. There, uh, Elko Corner Notched, or you know, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know, uh, Clovis. Say, um, <laughs> we can actually look at them with geometric morphometric analyses and start to say, actually, these two types are spatially indistinguishable from one another. Sort of like how we run chi squared tests, and we say. The null hypothesis cannot be rejected. Clovis is identical to Falsum. I mean, that might be, you know, I'm not going to, hopefully I'm not shocking anyone or I'm not saying they are (laughs) the same, but that's the kind of things that we can test with geometric morphometrics that you can do in R. Like to start to say, Mm -hmm. hey, these are nonsense categories. They don't actually have any sort of analytical utility. We're just pigeonholing things into categories because we like to. So that's all I have to say about R and why you should learn R. (laughs) I've got one thing to throw out about R. Um, I've tried learning a few times. I've used it a little bit. Um, It doesn't quite work the way my brain works. But one thing that I found that made it make a lot more sense and feel free to disagree with uh, with this recommendation is uh, Tidyverse. Mm -hmm. That suite of packages to, uh, to, to help 
kind of standardized the language and what the capabilities are in a way that that made it make more sense for me personally whenever whenever I've had to use it. Uh, have you used Tidyverse at all? I have not used Tidyverse, but I'm certainly not trying to say that R is like the end all be all, but certainly for certain sorts of research, it is the only stats package that actually can do it at the moment. Mm-hmm. And I think I guess it comes like with learning R, it also comes with sort of the general idea of like, if you can learn something about programming, I think it's going to, I mean, honestly, the computer science kids that I have in my classes end up doing so much better in the archaeology classes than most of my other students, because they already have to deal with data management, database, Hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. for creation code. And I think it prepares them in a way to think about data that doesn't that other students aren't actually thinking about because their brains aren't forced to think about data in that way. So when I say yeah, R, I really I'm saying you could try Python. Maybe you have no interest in R and you actually want to learn more about GIS. Well, QGIS is Python based. Learn some Python. Mm-hmm. I, I think that would be just as useful. And you may find Python is more interesting and more more, I guess, easily understood than say R. I, I'll make a comment on QGIS real quick. As a small business owner, I first learned GIS. I don't even remember what I was using. It wasn't ArcGIS. It was something else back in college when I really first had to use it on my own for my thesis. And then when I got out and eventually I ended up starting my own company and tell you what, I couldn't afford an ArcGIS license. I did take a class a graduate course on ArcGIS when I was at the University of Georgia for my master's, but that was really my only familiarity with it, right, was was that course. And we went over lots of things over the course of a semester. So some of it stuck and some of it didn't. But as a small business owner, I'm all about the right tool for the right job. And 99% of the time when I'm getting work for my small company, I need to produce maps. And that's pretty much it, right? And sometimes you don't even need GIS for that, (laughs) to be honest, if you're going to do it. But QGIS does do a decent job at doing that, especially if I need to take other data sets. That's when I really need it, right? If I'm producing my own maps, there's a number of ways that I can get my points into a thing on an image and produce a map to scale, all right? That's not hard. There's lots of different apps out there that'll do that, even on tablets, things like that. You might not have to go to a full GIS, But if the Forest Service or the BLM gives me a set of shape files and says, here's the thing you got to look at or a client does, I better have somewhat of an understanding of GIS to be able to load those shape files in, load my project area in, and then bring in the other data sources that I need to do in order to use that. And QGIS is great for that. And to to piggyback off what you were saying, Eric, there's a lot of good resources out there for it. I mean, if you want to know how to something and do something in QGIS, YouTube it because there's probably 50 videos about that one topic, and some are better than others, but they're all out there, and you can you can learn pretty quickly. So, I'm a huge proponent of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Q, that's why QGIS or GIS in general is the first thing on my list of um, low cost or low barrier to entry technology that I think everyone should dabble in. So then past uh, QGIS or GIS in general and R or stats uh, in general, yeah, what would be your third uh, high tech but low barrier to entry, low cost, uh, ahem, low tech? I would say the TPS suite. I forget what TPS stands for, but it's by uh, F. James Rolfe of Stony Brook University. It was originally designed for biology samples and how to use biological specimens. And I, there are plenty of other apps that that probably could get away with this, but I'm preferential to TPS because I've been using it for like four-ish years now. And essentially what it is, is you can do some some geometric morphometric analysis. And I know I've I've spoke highly of that, but you can also do a lot of data mining with just TPS and photos. So I'm actually working on an article right now that's looking at over 1,200 lithics that I've literally just got the image from an online source, whether that's eBay or which I know, you know, I'm not buying the artifact, but I'm, you know, they're putting the uh, the photo out there with the scale and context. I'm, you know, taking a taking that photo and using it or, you know, digital repositories for publications like uh, the Ohio State University has all of the past issues of Ohio Archaeologist, which is an amateur collector's sort of magazine. And it goes back to the 50s. So I combed through that and just, you know, clipped images. If they had a scale in the photo and at least county level provenience, 
I kept it because with that scale and TPS, you can actually take linear measurements. So if you want to know, you know, the ratio of the blade to the stem, or if you want to measure a pot shirt, you can get more accurate measurements than you can with calipers because with calipers, how do you accurately measure that the midway point of say a projectile point? You can't really do that as well as you can with mm-hmm. just a photo or getting tip angle or all these other sorts of basic linear measurements that I think you can do in the TPS suite. So if you just look up TPS DIG, TPS DIG or TPS RELW relative warps, all these other kinds of packages, you can do all sorts of fun data collection just from a photo. So you can just tell someone, send me a photo with a scale and I can get some information off of it. So that that would be the last okay. one, I guess, on my, my list and archive.org. <laughs> I would also say use archive.org if you aren't already. All right. Well, that is a fantastic list. We're going to have links to most of this stuff, if not all of it, in more in the show notes. So check that out. And we'll have a link to Eric's past episode, too, uh, that we did a few months ago. So, Eric, thanks again for coming on the Archaeotech podcast. And I really hope we can have you on again soon because there's so many more things we can talk about. In fact, I think the listeners are probably already clamoring, clamoring for an Eric Paul episode where you just geek out about R and Linux. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I could I, I could talk about Linux and R. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Well, again, thanks a lot. We much appreciate you coming on. And for everybody else, we will see you in two weeks. We'll be back with another one. And I don't know what happened to Paul. He muted, but I'll say it. Wash your hands. Thanks and see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Archaeotech Podcast. Links to items mentioned on the show are in the show notes at www.archpodnet.com slash archaeotech. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com and paul at lugal.com. Support the show by becoming a member at archpodnet.com slash members. The music is a song called Off Road and is licensed free from Apple. Thanks for listening. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info. The Labor Day weekend sale is on at Tanger Outlets. Score up to 70% off at top brands like Nike Factory Store, Crocs, J. Crew Factory, Gap Outlet, and so many more. Refresh your wardrobe with the latest arrivals for less from all your favorite brands this Labor Day weekend. Tanger Outlets, always on trend, always on sale. Plan your trip at tanger.com. <laughs>